Hardberger Park from conception to completion. And we'll just be a moment while we switch out these presentations. So much for the recordings in progress. Thank you so much for having me here today. I really appreciate being able to come out and speak with you guys um, regarding really Phil Harburger Park, but most notably the Lamb Bridge. So today I'm going to take you on a journey um, of Phil Harburger Park, kind of go over all the programs and all the different groups uh, that we work with today and everything that we're doing today. Um, also take you through the land bridge and some really interesting from conception to completion um, moments. And then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the plants and some of the challenges that we have. Um, if you don't know, my name's Wendy Leonard. I've been with this park since 2007. And so it's been really interesting for me to see this park from when it was a piece of Kind of raw land that no one really knew about and no one really set foot on and I was one of the first people to come out here and set foot on this piece of land and try and conceptualize what the designers were saying would happen and looking at it going really you really think that's going to happen out here okay <laughs> and so it's been interesting to see it's almost like having a child and watch it graduate and go to college, you know? And so this has kind of been, you know, part of that entire process. So it's been really neat for, for me from a personal perspective to be with a piece of land for that long and to see it grow into what we're gonna see um, today through the presentation and, and what the park is today. So um, really, you know, the park and the conservancy work together um, a lot and we have the same mission. And really our mission is not only to connect people to nature and have meaningful, um, inspiring um, relationships between and, and experiences between those engagements, but to also kind of have a, um, a really have a showcase model for not just for other parks in San Antonio, but other parks around the world and in the United States and around the world. So we're really trying to showcase how we can have this urban ecology right here in the middle of the heart of the city. And we have a number of different partners. Of course, you guys in Native Plant Society of Texas, we partner a lot with uh, Texas Children in Nature uh, Network and that, you know, again, the same mission, just trying to get those kiddos out there, trying to get them connected to nature and, and get them educated on everything nature. Um, then, of course, the Master Naturalist, the Ar Alamo Area Master Naturalist, Texan by Nature and um, Texas Master Gardener. We also have partnerships with a lot of other entities that are not mentioned here, um, like Bear Audubon, San Antonio Audubon, um, you know, North American Butterfly Association. We have a lot of partnerships um, that we, um, we work with. With the Alamo Area Master Naturalists, um, we have a number of different um, programs that they run and it's really great. Uh, the first is the bird water feature on the Blanco Road side of the park and that's next to the Salado outdoor classroom area and that was solely built by volunteers, master naturalist volunteers and the amount of wildlife and birds that flock to this water feature is great. We It's run by a group of volunteers um, that kind of go maintain it, uh, make sure everything's functioning properly. And it's been, uh, like I said, a Mecca for the, the birds and other um, wildlife in the area. I'm so sorry to interrupt. We just had a problem with Zoom. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, everybody. Um, we just realized that it's not working for our Zoom folks. And I'm sorry if you guys didn't see my presentation. I had no idea, but I think you didn't. <laughs> Only the people in the room did. So I think it's this one here. And we, ch we chose the other one. Okay. 
Okay, I think we might be back on track, but we can check. Is that what you see over there, Terry? Okay. Good. We're, We're good. Sorry, guys, that you didn't get you didn't see my presentation. I apologize. <clears throat> So we have the Butterfly Learning Center. That's also Alamo Area Master Naturalist um, run program. And that um, is in an area, and we'll talk about this here in a little bit, where it's not accessible uh, regularly to the public, only through um, some of the programs that are being run out there or big events like Dairy Days. We have the third Saturday program, the fourth Saturday program. And uh, Lee Marlowe mentioned the native plant wildscape demonstration garden. That's right outside our door. Um, you guys, please come hear Patsy uh, Kuntz next, next month talk about that. They have done an unbelievable job. I Every time I take people on a tour, we either stop there or we go through there because it's just a beautiful area, completely done uh, and maintained through volunteer support. Now it's not cooperating. Okay. So I just wanted to point out a few of these areas. Um, I don't know if you can see, you probably can't see my mouse, but at the top of the screen there, the upper left-hand corner, that's the Velker Homestead. The um, Velker Homestead, like I mentioned, we have a lot of stuff going on in that area, but it's not open to the public uh, regularly, only through special programming or um, special events that we have there. In that area, we have the um, Master Gardeners um, Children's Vegetable Garden. We have the BLC, the Butterfly Learning Center. Um, and then we also have um, a lot of historic features there. And whenever we have special events um, for history of the area, we, we open that up as well. Um, every year we started back with our dairy days, which is really exciting in the fall. So uh, that's where we have dairy days. And then the, the park is 330 acres. And before the land bridge was built, the lower uh, 200 plus acres was not connected to the upper the, on, on the north side of Orsbach Parkway, the upper um, over a hundred acres. So the land bridge really worked to connect the two sides together and allow accessibility for a lot of the foot traffic that we get. We get a lot of people just walking in here. Um, and now that's opened up a completely new section of trail for folks um, and people who come down the Slotto Creek Greenway who come in either on foot or on bicycle now have a new, a whole new area to explore on the Northwest military side of the park. So it's been very exciting. Um, on this side of the park, on the Northwest military side of the park, um, we have a nature play area. Now this area has been really exciting because um, some high profile trees that have had to come down, get a second life in this nature playscape area. And one of those trees is the Spanish oak, huge heritage Spanish oak, um, at the a huge red oak at the Spanish at the governor's palace, sorry, Spanish red oak at the governor's palace um, here in San Antonio had to come down. It was compromised, and they had to go ahead and take the tree down. And these trees, are, the trunks are massive. They were cut into sections, and we were able to use heavy equipment to get these trees, at, these trunks, and put them in the nature playscape area. And the kids just climb all over them. So this has provided us a, a means to get these trees a second life, a second purpose, and not just, um, you know, dispose of them. They are now, you know, connecting kids to nature through having them, you know, uh, providing a means where they can play on something natural. On both sides of the park, we have um, dog parks on both the Blanco Road side and the Northwest Military side. And we are actively uh, maintaining the both entrances on the Northwest Military side and the Blanco Road side for native wildflowers and native flowers. Um, one experiment that I did this year, and I don't know if y'all saw this driving in on the Northwest Military side over here, is um, the deer pea veg went crazy. And it the frog fruit died back significantly. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna let the deer pea veg go. 
and see if the frog fruit will come up underneath it. And sure enough, the deer pea vetch, you know, unfortunately it's still there, but I think as the weather warms, it'll kind of die out. But the frog fruit has kind of gotten a jump start and all underneath that deer pea vetch. I don't know if you guys have been here prior to this past uh, winter and summer, but the frog fruit at the front entrance has just been a mat and it just it lays over the curb, the curb and kind of out into the driveway. And we always had to go and weed eat it back a little bit. So um, it's still there. It just needed a little bit of protection. It needed that cover crop. So we're kind of playing that experiment right now. And probably next week, we're gonna get in there and start pulling some of that stuff back because the frog fruit is ready to go. Um, on this side of the park, we have a couple really exciting areas. Um, we have our restored wetland area that's at the end of the asphalt drive. Whenever you drive in, you come to a stop sign and you can take a right. I really encourage some of you guys who are really into sedges and rushes and wetland plants to go check this out. Um, right now we have Carolina canary grass um, growing like crazy. I'm sorry, I'm just using common names because I, I would butcher any sort of scientific name. So we have that, we have a lot of rushes, a lot of sedges. And I really, I've always wanted that area to be kind of a, a place where we could do a wetland plants class. So right now is a really good time to go check that out. There's a lot of wonderful plants growing down there. In the fall we get, we usually get um, marsh fleabane and hint, hint, nudge, nudge. I've been wanting to try and propagate that um, because it's just a gorgeous plant. Um, so that's, that's another one to kind of keep eye, an eye on. Um, Obviously out here, we have our restored savanna, 13 acres of restored grassland savanna. When the park was first built, a lot of folks asked this question, why do you have trees where you have grasses? Well, you know, there's that negotiating factor. So we had to keep about 20% of the, um, the tree cover in this area. And so we kind of went through and picked out the large trees. Um, and a lot of the other stuff was just brush. And so we cleared out the brush and restored about 13 acres to this grassland savanna that you see today. And then on the other side, one of um, another experiment that has gone very well is at the end of Velker Lane, it was a maintenance yard and it was compacted caliche base. It was really nasty. I never thought anything would ever grow in this area. And so after the land bridge contractors left, we dug up all of that base, probably in an area that's about a half an, half an acre to an acre. We dug up all of that compacted caliche base and restored the area through planting and seeding. And now it is just gorgeous. And you would never know what it had been before. One of my favorite parts of the park is the historic homestead. I always tell Denise and the Conservancy that they have the best office in the whole world. They have the 1840s stone house that has been not restored, but refurbished. And it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, then there's also the red barn, the red dairy barn that has been restored and is pending some, uh, some other uh, restoration um, um, facelift stuff um, on the record, um, on the books uh, coming to that very soon. And then the children's vegetable garden. And then this, this is an outdoor kind of classroom garden project that mimics what the San Antonio Botanical Gardens does on Saturday, but we do ours on Tuesday. So we get a lot of the homeschool kids um, come out. There's um, every Tuesday, there's a, an instruction uh, component to the program. And then there's also just time in the garden and being able to harvest food and take it home. So that's been a really great program. And again, this entire area is only open um, when we have programs. And then of course the Butterfly Learning Center, which has just been so gorgeous lately with all um, the plants blooming. Today, we're at the Urban Ecology Center. We have this gathering hall. We also have the classroom. Um, and then mentioned before, the native um, plant wildscape demonstration garden is just glorious. And it's just right outside over here. And it takes up this entire space. And again, it's, it's maintained solely by volunteers. 
on the east side of Hardburger Park. If you haven't been, you need to go check out Phil's tree. It's the tree that started it all. Um, and we'll see a picture of that here pretty soon, but it's, um, the tree has such character um, over the at least couple hundred years that it has lived. It has developed um, kind of reaction wood. And so uh, it kind of has a twist and a twirl as you look at some of the, um, the growth. So it's, it's been um, a really wonderful tree. There's uh, a, a trail and a bench that lead up to the tree as well as some signage. And that's the tree that started it all. So that's Phil's tree. Um, most of you may or may not know that Hardburger Park used to be Velker Dairy Farm. Um, it had been a dairy farm since the 1800s. Um, and I remember when I came out here in 2007, seeing fresh cow patties still on the ground. They were moving the last bit of the cows out. Um, and we still have the caretaker um, who helped run the cattle for many Velker um, over in the white bungalow house at the homestead area. And his knowledge and expertise has been wonderful for the park. Um, this picture, is of Max and Minnie Velker, and they were the owners of this land prior to us um, acquiring the property. As mentioned before, Phil Hardberger Park was bisected by Warsbach Parkway, and really the only way to get from one side to the other was to get in your vehicle and drive. Um, you could walk the sidewalks, which was very um, unevent well, could be eventful on Warsbach Parkway. Hopefully not <laughs> eventful, but it's not something that you would want to do. So building this land bridge to connect both sides of the park was instrumental. And the design team for this entire park is um, Stimson Studios, Steve Stimson, and really when designing the land bridge, we needed to, and they needed to take into consideration the topography and also the vegetation communities within this area. What are we gonna put back on the land bridge to make it blend in to the rest of the park? And so as mentioned before, you know, being with this park since 2007, I was actually here when they had the community involvement meetings where they would brainstorm what we wanted at this park. I remember Frisbee golf was one of those things where I thought, oh, no, please, I'm nothing wrong with Frisbee golf, but we can't have every single thing at this park. So um, I just remember that entire process. And I remember, you know, <clears throat> them coming up with this <clears throat> land bridge and thinking, wow, that's gonna be something. If we ever get to that point, that's gonna be something. And it's always been kind of in the back of our minds, well, we're never gonna get to that point. We'll never get there. And sure enough, I woke up one day and the land bridge was there and I thought, what in the world? How did that happen? <clears throat> yes. Well, <laughs> so there are land bridges that exist either for people or for wildlife. A lot of land bridges that are out there are to benefit wildlife. And this really merges both together for wildlife and, and people on the same bridge, which is really great. And now we're seeing a lot of the similar types. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about was a skywalk. We're kind of seeing some other parks start to incorporate kind of a skywalk into their park because it's just so neat, you know, being able to see that area of the ecosystem that you're not really a part of up in the tree canopy is a very neat concept. Um, so this was the conceptual design at the very beginning. And as you can see, you know, they started off with a drawing down here. And so this was something I thought, wow, if we ever get to this point, that's going to be something. I hope I, I'm here when that happens. Um, and Really, one of the most amazing features is the skywalk. So not just the land bridge itself, but this skywalk that takes folks um, up from a, you know, your, your actual terrestrial level where you're walking on the, the land and gradually takes you up into the canopy of the trees. And a lot of folks 
um, you know, they, they walk it and they don't stop to look around. And one day I stopped and looked around and there were, there was a bar now. Um, there was a crested caracara. There were lizards up in the tree. And so I always tell people, slow down, stop and look. You're in a whole different area of the park that's loaded with wildlife. So that's been a really neat um, part of the park, a part of the land bridge. The other part of the land bridge, which I really encourage people to, to stop because they usually just kind of walk right past, stop and take a look at these wildlife viewing mm -hmm. blinds. They are part of a public art. Um, the one on this side of, of the land bridge is uh, by Ashley Morales and it features the native uh, uh, flora of the area. And so these side panels are the native flora of the park. And then the one on the north side of the land bridge going towards the Blanco Road side of the park uh, was Cade Bradshaw. And it features the um, fauna of the park. And so what's really neat, a lot of people don't know this, but if you go into the wildlife blind and put your iPhone on, or your phone on camera mode and look at the panels through your camera phone, they pop out, uh, the images pop out a lot better than just kind of staring at them with your own eyes. It's just like those, those uh, pictures where you'd stare at them for five minutes before an image would pop out at you and sometimes it never would, but it's a lot better than that because you can really see it. Um, so each panel has something different and it's, it's really neat. So I encourage folks to go check out both of those um, wildlife features and each wildlife feature looks out. You can see up here, there is um, a, a kid looking out through an opening onto a wildlife guzzler. So they look out onto an area that is fed through drip, um, through a little bit of a water drip into a wildlife water feature. And so you can really um, hopefully see, I know on this side of the park, there's always an Eastern Phoebe that likes to hang out at that one and catch bugs. So um, they really do like those water features. Um, another interesting thing about the, the land bridge is that it really used surface water runoff to, um, to really irrigate the landscape for uh, the land bridge. And so this kind of this massive French drain system was put in with this underground 250,000 gallon tank uh, that uses just kind of the surface water runoff filtered into this tank. And then that tank is used to help water um, the landscape up on the, on the bridge. And that's really neat. There was actually, I think two years ago, we had a massive rain event and it almost looked like a lake out there because a lot of water came in and it was just kind of slowly filtering through the system. So it was really neat. Um, one thing that always amazes me is the timeline for construction. Of course, when we're in this timeline, it's not happening fast enough. But when we look back, wow, we did that in two years. Are you kidding? That's great. So construction started in November of 2018. And we actually opened up the pedestrian trail, not the skywalk, in December of 2020. And um, it, it was kind of a, a very stressful event because we're, you know, we're in COVID, we're opening up a very big event, a very big trail, um, but it was wonderful. And the amount of people that came that day and used the trail has been wonderful. And since that point, we've slowly been trying to get all the odds and ends um, completed. And we finally got, I think the last bit signed over to us, the landscaping in July of this year. So I just wanted to take you through the whole process. Uh, January, 2020, April, June, that's a really neat picture. Then it's all starting to come together with the inspector himself. <laughs> then the soil. Hold on, it's a little slow. And then um, this is when we opened in December, 2020. 
this was our opening day and just a massive amount of people out here walking the trails. They were ready. Um, obviously the landscape wasn't ready. We had a lot of, uh, the contractor had a lot of loose ends to tie up and we spent um, the rest of the two years uh, tying up those loose ends. So hopefully we'll be able to see this video. Oh, what happened to it? Let's see if this will play. Darn. Maybe the mouse? Oh. Uh huh. Yes. Shows that it's playing. I don't think that this. Sometimes when the. Sometimes when you do the mouse. Oh, so you're in. You know, I'm going to switch this. Oh. Oh no, we don't want that. Sorry, everybody. The, our Zoom people are seeing. Um, Sorry, the Zoom review. Yeah. Okay, screen share just stopped, just so you know. Is this, is this, which one is it? Oh, this one. This one, yeah. Try it down here. Um, there it is. Something. <laughs> <laughs> Back. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> I want the video. I don't. Yeah, I don't know if we're going to be able to see the video. Okay. Usually the little so. play pops up. Yeah, I saw it pop up just just, just, for, a yeah, just for a second. Yeah, just for a second. No, it's not even. Oh. Maybe go back one right ahead of it and then go to the. Front okay, that's it right go. there. There oh, it is. There it is. Okay. Let's go. Let's go. There. Yeah. No. no? <laughs> Oh, okay. Was oh, maybe that was Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so no video, but um, it's a really great short video that shows kind of time lapse of the entire construction. If you guys get on YouTube and Google it, it you'll be able to see it. And maybe if we have some time uh, at the end, I'll try and bring it up through that way if we're connected to the internet on this one. So you know, I mentioned before that Steve Stimson and um, the associates uh, with his group really took into consideration the eco, um, sorry, the vegetation and, and eco regions. Let me get this on the way. Are y'all seeing this? Okay. I just wanted to make sure y'all can see everything. Um, so really at Hardberger Park, I don't think people realize how many different regions we have of the park. Um, and, you know, one area that I like to really point out is when you get on the Blanco Road side of the park, when you're close to the Salado Creek Greenway um, trail system, you get some really big, tall trees. You get a lot more cedar elms, you get a lot bigger live oaks. And kind of on this side of the park, it's a little bit more shrubby, shrubby in a lot of areas. And so we really have a conglomerate of these different um, eco regions and vegetation communities. So really when they built the land bridge, they tried to take this into consideration as far as what vegetation we're gonna put back on the land bridge that grows here naturally at the park um, and in these types of eco regions. some reason it's not responding to me. Oh, there we go. Okay, so this is the um, Blanker Road side of the park. So you can see over here, we have a lot of large tree species, a lot of live oaks and cedar elms. And this is um, what they took into consideration when laying out the vegetation on this side of the park. Um, and then on this side of the park, they also took into consideration, it's more of a, a scrubby, type of uh, ecosystem. So 11 tree species, six shrubs, 10 grasses, six forbs, and three cacti were, the, were planted up on the land bridge. Um, and then four different seed mixes were used. Uh, we wound up planting over 4,000 um, trees, shrubs, grasses, forbs. Uh, a lot of plant material went in. So this is just kind of a rundown of the different trees that were planted. Some of the ones that were planted that we don't have in the park um, 
as of now we do, thanks to Lambridge, is the Anaqua. And then there was another one on here, Lacey Oak. Everything else we have in, we had had in the park. Um, they planted agarita, a lot of button bush, evergreen sumac, flame leaf sumac, um, fragrant sumac. I fought this one tooth and nail to not get yopon holly up there. And by darn it, they planted yopon holly. And it's not, last I checked, it is not doing well. So that was, um, yeah. Why, why did you not want the yopon uh, Because um, it's, it does better more east of here. Um, I have never experienced, my experience in this area is that it does not do well. Even though it's native to Texas, it's native to more east of Texas where it gets a lot more moisture. And sure enough, they flashed very quickly and it's been a struggle to keep the specimens that were put out there alive. <laughs> Um, we did plant so tall, uh, twist leaf yucca, the prickly pear cactus, interesting story. The prickly pear cactus was actually harvested. Some of it was harvested from a park that we're opening up on the north side of San Antonio. And so some of those pads were brought in um, from there. So that's, that's pretty local. Um, and so some of those prickly pear had to be removed. And so they, they were trans, they were located here. Um, we, we actually planted, the contractor planted big blue stem, little blue stem, switchgrass and Indian grass, but then we seeded a whole bunch of other grasses as well. So it's been interesting to see what comes, what's coming up. And then a lot of forbs and wildflowers. Um, Along the trail, we wanted to add color, a lot of color, a lot of um, wildflower types of, of plants. So we did kind of the more perennial mealy blue sage, rock rose, pavonia. Uh, we have, and you'll see here in a little bit, we have our designated blue bonnet areas where we are actively maintaining those as blue bonnet areas. And it's our goal to keep those areas going. Um, everybody loves blue bonnets. And so we're, we're just trying to keep that right next to the trail and really give it a good, a good color. Um, we did plant a lot of Texas lantana that are doing well and a lot of Zixmenia that are doing well. The white mist flower, I'm not I'm hard pressed to find those out there. Um, some of the volunteers, so this has been a lot of fun, the Datura, <laughs> that's been a lot of fun. We get a lot of questions about how can we let that grow there, but it's, it's a really neat plant. It, it, yes, exactly. Um, and then the buffalo burr we've had here in the park and that it seems to be doing pretty well up there here and there. Right now, um, and y'all can help me out on this one, we're getting a lot of the Texas thistle up on the land bridge. Um, and it's, it's a lot. And I'm fine with that, but other people are saying, are you sure you want all this Texas thistle? Well, we've got other problems, so we'll, we'll worry about that Texas thistle later if we need to. The seeds are good for the birds. Seeds are good for the birds. The, the blooms are great for... No. I know. Yeah, we're just, we're going after the stuff that is, uh, creates monocultures that is not native. Um, clammy wheat has been a lot of fun. That's popped up. Um, and then frost weed, I learned that frost weed and whoever grows frost weed here, oh, that's one of my favorite plants. I have, a, I have transplanted that stuff and abused it and you know, said it is not gonna survive. And I put it in the soil and I water it. And a couple of weeks later, it's just, it's ready to, you know, to start growing again. It's just amazing stuff. So that stuff has actually popped up out there. We have a lot of it here in the park. And, um, and so the seed bank was there. Um, and then sunflower, um, some hairy grama up there, which we didn't plant. And um, so this, just to kind of show you how quickly things filled in, uh, December, 2020, pretty bare. Most of the trees were in, um, some of the shrubs. And then this was April, 2022, mostly green. Um, some of the challenges have been um, the contractor having access uh, you can kind of see this road from the, the edge of the land bridge up. 
They still needed access to get to certain points to do some of their um, you know, remaining items. And so that has been kind of a thoroughfare for the, some of these exotics um, kind of being brought in. And so that, that really hindered uh, some progress in that area. And then again, the staging area down here uh, still needed a lot of coverage. And then, it, but still, I mean, it, it, it flushed in pretty well, um, in, in my opinion. So right now what we're doing is every week we have Weed Wednesday Warriors. And these folks have been with me for a long time. They are some of the best plant uh, folks that I have. We have a core group. Um, we've really been working um, to, you know, not just up on the land bridge, but in other areas of the park to get out there and pull um, some of our most noxious exotic invasives. And I like to tell this story where we had a really bad Malta star thistle problem here at the park. And we, and maybe Jerry Morrissey was here whenever we attacked the Malta star thistle. And everybody thought, you have got to be out of your mind. There's no way you're going to get a hold on this. And we attacked it and we attacked it and we pulled it and we bagged it and we, we wouldn't stop. And now, granted, I see some near the roadway that makes me a little nervous, you know, up near Northwest military, but where we had the problem, we don't have it anymore. And so, and the same thing with mustard, giant mustard over at Walker Ranch. We pulled and pulled and pulled that stuff. Yesterday I saw a couple, but it was just a couple. And whereas before it was a whole field of mustard. And now we've got um, some of the native grasses and wildflowers coming up. So it's amazing what a group of people can do if you never give up. And so that's the Weed Wednesday Warriors. Uh, we tried to branch out. Uh, we had, and I'll show you here in a little bit, we had um, some other folks come and help us, but now we're streamlining things into just Wednesdays. So that way I don't get um, too strung out with all the different needs, you know, here and there. But uh, we are doing, and we have a, a flyer back there. You know, when we were doing mustard, it was hold the mustard. Um, what were some of the other ones that we had? Uh, arrest the Arundo, we've done that before. And so now this one is rip the rescue. So we really need people to help us on the land bridge to rip that rescue grass. And it, you don't have to get out there and work, you can supervise. So this was, <laughs> and some of y'all love to be supervisors. I know I got some supervisors out there. Um, so this is actually the upper left-hand corner uh, in the white shirt. That's one of the Weed Wednesday Warriors supervising. This day we had UTSA, Whole Foods, and in the blue shirts, it was an automotive shop and I can't remember their name great group of people um, and we we had 30 people up there on a Tuesday morning for three hours and we ripped the rescue and so I had I think three weed Wednesday warriors come out Tuesday just to help supervise because these are these are folks that why are you taking this grass out it's green green's good right well so you know it's good to have those subject matter experts up there and so we'd like to do more of this where we have those subject matter experts and then we because i have a group of people i have lot shops of law Cantera coming out at 8 30 tomorrow morning and so I'm, i put the call out there please somebody come and help me <laughs> supervise um because we get we have we have some great workforce out there, we just need supervisors. And in the past, I have let really knowledgeable people get together on a Saturday or a Sunday morning. You know, y'all go for it. I'll get you trash bags. Y'all just meet up if you want to do 10 minutes, 30 minutes, two hours, whatever you want to do. Um, just go for it. And I'll let I'll let everybody know you'll be out there. So um, just putting the call out there. Um, it really does take a community, and we're seeing that with a lot of these big. Um, companies uh, come in and help us. Um, so we're trying, we're throwing everything, even the kitchen sink at this problem. And, and again, it, I'm, I'm hoping that in the next couple of years, we'll look back and say, 
that rescue grass go? Well, I don't care, you know, we're on to the next problem. Just like the multistar thistle and just like the, the mustard, um, if, you, if you throw everything at it and you get the people out there, you can really uh, put a dent in things. And so that's my call to you guys, if you have any, any desire. Um, I can't leave without um, sharing some land bridge uh, pictures with you guys, the land bridge study. So um, Casey, the park naturalist has, um, her and the other park naturalist um, had put together a land bridge study. So now it's Casey running the, the program. She has 14 cameras up on the land bridge in different sections. So the idea is that, you know, if an animal is spotted in section three and section two and section one, then that's considered kind of a positive moving through the entire land bridge rather than just walking up section three, you know, and just passing by the land bridge. So she has these cameras set up at these different sections and we have um, caught everything except for a mountain lion and a feral hog. Um, I'm not kidding. I mean, every single thing. Deer, this is a um, cottontail rabbit, possum, coyote. Some really great pictures of, of coyotes have been uh, caught up there, beautiful. This one, this one's beautiful, red-shouldered hog. Bobcat, and we actually had a park patron, and I believe her, um, lucky, lucky, she saw one late afternoon, early evening, she saw a mother with, I think it was two or three kits, um, walking kind of from the land bridge onto this side of the park. So they're definitely out there. Beautiful fox. And this one's really cute. Ringtail cat, which you hardly ever see, and it's got a lizard in its mouth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that one's a lot of fun. Yeah, that one's really cute. And so as mentioned before, we, you know, pretty much everything um, except for that, you know, we also, what is not pictured up here, believe it or not, is the access deer. We actually do have access deer in this park. Uh, we've seen it and we've seen it on the, the camera. So just fair warning, you know, if you're out walking in the park and you're wondering why that large white-tailed deer has dots on it, it could be an axis. So that's what we have to deal with. So, you know, we really um, encourage you guys to, to help us out, whether you want to be a, a, a Rip the Rescue supervisor in the next couple of weeks, or if you just want to get, you know, your family out there and not have to be supervised or supervise anybody or get a friend, do 30 minutes. I'll take whatever you got to give. I will at this point in time. And then, um, you know, we do have the Weed Wednesday program where we're out there every Wednesday. Um, and then, you know, you can take home a piece of the park with you. You can get a book through the Conservancy. This is a great book, a lot of beautiful photos in that book. You can donate, you can become a member. There's so many ways to get involved. And with that, I will take any questions. I know I might have some. Thank you, thank you. That's it, questions? So where is the rescue grass go? Oh, I know. I... Right, so the question is, where is rescue grass from? And I knew I was gonna get that question. I didn't research it, but that's why I have these two wonderful. Okay, another question. Okay, another question. <laughs> We're gonna find out, that's a good question. Yes. I saw it at the edge of the land bridge. You had like an eight foot excluding fence. I'm assuming that's to protect the roadway. Um, uh, yes. So it's really to um, limit access from uh, pedestrians coming up the road and from people coming down. And then also to help funnel wildlife up to the bridge. How far along the road is so good question. So the, the fence actually runs along Northwest military or along, sorry, Warsbach Parkway on both sides. Um, for this side, it runs probably almost to, I think I'm on the, what is this? The west side of the land bridge, it runs almost to the property line, but on the east side of the land bridge, it definitely runs all the way to the property line. It's a brand new, uh, high, pretty high fence, yes. Um, when was the land purchased for the park and was Wurzbach Parkway already here or was it after? 
Good question. So the, the land was purchased in two, oh, sorry. Um, so the question was, is pretty much when was uh, Phil Harburger Park purchased and was Warsbuck Parkway um, here when the land was purchased? So Phil Harburger Park was purchased in two acquisitions, one in 2006 and one in 2007. And during that time, uh, Warsbuck Parkway was not here. Um, I don't believe it was here at all. And I can't remember what year Warsbach Parkway went in. Um, the expansion was like 2014, I think, when the, when the expansion opened. Yes. It was, it was already planned? It was planned. So it was planned, but not built. Yes. I was wondering why they didn't make Instead of having to do the land for it, why wasn't Warsaw Parkway elevated? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Too much planning. <laughs> uh -huh. So, uh, Rescue Rex is, according to Wikipedia, native to South America. Rescue Grass, oh. according to Wikipedia, is native to South America. And we have some questions in the chat on the two. Okay. So, the first one is uh, why is the land bridge so small and so narrow? <laughs> I think it all goes back to engineering. Um, so uh, why is the land bridge so sm uh, small and narrow? Actually, the footprint of the land bridge takes up about 10 acres. I sat there and did it through um, two different means, ArcGIS and um, Google Earth, where you can do the measuring tool. And the actual footprint is about 10 acres. Um, but over Warsbach Parkway itself, um, it, it's an engineering um, masterpiece. And really, I think they maxed out on the width that they could go. And if you look at it and you look at other land bridges that incorporate both, um, well, I mean, we don't, we're kind of setting the bar, but to incorporate both pedestrian trail and high use pedestrian trail with the wildlife usage, um, we kind of were, were pushing the the envelope of how wide we could go and still meet um, the engineering uh, uh, requirements for the land bridge design. Another question, are there options for more land bridges planned? Are there options for more land bridges planned? Um, not within the park. Um, I know in Houston, they're building something um, of the sort. I haven't you know, been there to see it. I'm not too familiar with it but not for the park, but that was a question. Yeah, okay. there's a couple more questions. What other two cactus species do you have? What other two cactus species do we have on the land bridge? Uh, on the land bridge, it's just prickly pear cactus. Um, I'm trying to think out here on this side of the park. I have seen... Um, Tossahill. Mm, Tossahill. Yes, Tossahill, thank you. Uh, we have Tassahio, and then I don't think we have any, I'm trying to think if I've ever seen a lace cactus out here. I would be hard pressed to say we have lace. We have two species of uh, prickly pear though. Two species of prickly pear, right? The ingle, is it the ingle mania? And then, uh, a lot of hey Floyd. Name is oh, okay. <laughs> That's why Floyd's here. <laughs> it, it's Lindheimerized variety. And then high rise and then macroriza, which is a plain particular. Okay. Um, so, yes, and, from the expert, we have two different types of prickly pear, and I believe them. <laughs> oh, and we do have the cactus garden at the uh, Belfer Homestead, and we planted a lot of different things in there. Yes. Tons of cubic yards of soil. Yes, that's in my cheat sheet somewhere, and it is not in my brain tonight. Denise, do you remember? We have that figure. We do have that figure. We have that figure. We have, that figure. We have a cheat sheet. Um, yeah, I know I have it on my shared drive where I pulled this up. So there's. We got one question answered, so I just need to go back and look at that one. And we have another one here. Another um, one. 
Uh, what did you say about the tour? Someone asked a question from the floor, and it's something about it being desirable for some reason. So um, Datura, it, it was a volunteer species up on the land bridge. We have had it pop up here, here and there at the park. Um, it's a, a native species. Um, we have had some concern uh, of actually having it close to being, you know, in close proximity to the trail because um, it is a, a controversial plant uh, with, the, with the seed pods and the seeds inside. Um, so I encourage you to go look that up. I don't want to try and explain that, you know, what happens when people um, consume that. But uh, for the most part, very beautiful, uh, beautiful flowers, um, great pollinator plant. Um, so we really, I mean, and like I said, our, our um, thing is, is that if it's native and it's in the park, we're probably not going to try and control it unless it's, you know, um, growing out where we want to keep grasslands, then we're going to control that, the woody species, you know, coming up. But for the most part, in some of these areas that we're trying to revegetate, we're, we're not going to worry about detour. We're going to worry about, you know, the rescue grass and the old world blue stem. And there's just a follow-up there wondering mm -hmm. if it's poisonous. You may just want to mention toxins. Yes, yes. So it, it is considered poisonous. Yeah. And so that's the controversy, but you know, so is uh, silverleaf nightshade and a lot of the other plants that we have. And that's one reason why we encourage people to stay on the trail and to keep their dogs on a leash and to make sure their kids are staying on the trail with them um, is because there's a lot of unknown stuff off the trail. And we really don't want um, people to, you know, uh, go exploring um, without knowing some of that. So the depth varies. So this was really interesting. Um, so it, it's kind of shaped like a Pringle, um, if you think of a Pringle chip. And so there, there are areas where the soil is very, very thin. Um, at the top, I remember looking at um, some of the diagrams when we were looking at the vegetation going in. And at the very top next to the trail, I think that was the thinnest area. And so that was seeded with buffalo grass and some of those short, you know, grasses. And the soil depth varies quite a bit. Let me see if I can get back to that, that picture where they're moving soil. And you can actually hopefully see um, some of that. Let me see. Hold on. Might be easier. Let's see if I escape. I can. Whoop. <gasps> I stopped sharing. I hit the wrong button. I'm so sorry. I was trying to. Oh my gosh. I'm going to kick somebody out. Kicked a whole bunch of people out, I think. I'm so sorry. That's what happens when I do. Okay, good. They're still there. Well, I there was a picture on here. Yeah, where you can see the different grades of soil. This might be it. So there, because we wanted to have different, different. Share it again, I'm sorry. How did I do that? Oh, share. Yeah. I'm gonna try that. Ah, uh, PowerPoint. Okay, I, if I click on a button, it may be disastrous. <laughs> really? See? She knows. I don't though. That's oh. Let's <laughs> see. Oh, you just had the PowerPoint. Oh, yeah, okay. sorry. So now I got to figure out which screen it was. But one thing that we wanted to do was to actually. Oh, there we go. It was to actually create variable topography on the land bridge itself, so that way we created um, areas where the wildlife could move through and not be visible to the to the actual trail. And so we have different areas with different amounts of soil. So that way it's not a flat surface. It, it, there's variable topography on the land bridge itself to benefit the wildlife. Yes. Have we had much erosion on the land bridge? Have we had much erosion on the land bridge? That was a huge concern. There were some washout areas near the, um, near the, girders kind of where the girders meet the land 
the, the soil up there, there was a little bit of erosion. It really has not been bad at all. And that was one of the reasons to um, get the vegetation established quickly um, was to help, to help with that. Um, so it, it really, there were a few problem areas, but those were remedied pretty quickly. And uh, there were a few areas where the contractor had to go and pull, put bull rock and, and stuff like that. And that uh, seemed to help those little problem areas. Yes. Now that it's established, are you having to irrigate much? Now that it's established, are we having to irrigate much? We anticipate that there will probably be trees that we will have to irrigate for a while. Um, we, you know, obviously right now we have not run the irrigation since the fall. Uh, I think since October or November, we haven't run the irrigation at all. Um, the idea with that 250,000 gallon tank is that we will always have the option to run some sort of irrigation when we get to those really bad drought years. Um, and just really, you know, uh, formidable site conditions. Um, the whole land bridge as a whole has kind of different micro habitats. It's really weird. So when you're standing on top of the land bridge in between the two um, quartz and steel um, barricades, um, it, it could not be windy here. And then you go up there and there's just a breeze coming through. And so if you can imagine that in the summertime, it's really going to drive plant life out a lot quicker than on the sides. So, you know, us anticipating we're, we're probably going to have to irrigate some of those areas more um, than we than we, you know, would other areas of the land bridge. So having that 250,000 gallon tank is is going to be helpful for that in the long run. We have one more uh, question yes. here, and it's getting close to 8.15. We okay. probably want to wrap it up. I sure. can probably talk some hours more. Um, they're wondering if you could repeat who the designers and engineers were again. Repeat the designer. Um, is Steve Stimson uh, with Stimson and Associates. The engineer was Arab. Arab. Um, and they are international. And locally, the head of the design team was the opposite. That's correct. Yes, I forgot that. Um, Jim Gray at Rialto was um, kind of the local engineer. Okay, one last question. One last question. Here. If someone had two to three hours to spend at the park, where should they start? They should probably, okay, so if somebody had two to three hours to spend at the park, I would recommend my favorite. <laughs> This is really hard. So you can either start on the Northwest military side at the urban ecology center. If you're into architecture, I would recommend starting here and walking to the land bridge. And you would either walk down the land bridge and up the skywalk or down the skywalk and back up the land bridge. But you have got to do that skywalk. I like the Blanco road side of the park because of the trees. You get some really big trees on your walk um, through parts of Waterloo, um, and you can stop by and see Phil Hardberger tree, the Hardberger oak, and um, give it a great big hug and watch the birds, you know, um, frolic in the area. And so that would be great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys.